Hello everyone and welcome to the QWC uh, introduction and update webinar by MJH Software Services. Uh, I'd first like to thank Dialog for giving us this platform to talk to you about QWC. Um, my name is Chris and with me today is Michael who will be on the chat. Uh, so hopefully if that's working you'll be able to submit your question to that and he'll hopefully answer them for you. Uh, any particularly interesting ones we might look at at the end. Um, as I said, my name is Chris um, and, and with is Michael. We work for MJH Software Services. Uh, MJH Software Services has over 35 years experience of working and consulting on all matters APL. Over that time, Michael has worked over that time, Michael has worked with most, if not all of the different dialects of APL, including APL2, APL+, A+, and of course, Dialog APL. Michael has consulted for many companies worldwide, helping them with their various APL needs. About two years ago, uh, the company expanded with myself coming on board uh, initially in an apprenticeship role. One of the goals of this expansion uh, was to develop the QWC project from concept to market. Uh, it's been a long road, and uh, one which we're still traveling along, uh, but we're beginning to see a light at the end of the tunnel, uh, and we plan to release a beta version of QWC sometime early, this year, early next year. Okay, so in today's webinar, I will be briefly explaining the origins and some of the basic principles behind QWC. I will be giving a demonstration of some of the features available in the current version of QWC. I'll run through some of the upcoming improvements scheduled for future release and some of the internal changes we are making at MJH Software Services in order to better support this project. I'll also go through our future release plans and we'll be letting you know how you can get involved with the early trials and ultimately to help shape the direction and priorities of this uh, project. But firstly, what is QWC? Well, QWC is a product that we've been uh, developing that emulates the native, the native GUI creation function QuadWC. However, Whereas the GUI creation using QuadWC is limited to the Windows environment, GUIs created using QWC will work cross-platform. One of the main objectives of the QWC project is to emulate QuadWC as closely as possible. We hope that legacy systems will be able to move from QuadWC to QWC literally by replacing the quads with a Q. To this end, I'll be showing you some code um, later on demonstrating this. The, the QWC project doesn't just emulate QuadWC function though. It also has all the associated function, quad functions such as QuadWS, QuadWG, QuadNQ, and we'll be adding even more in future releases such as QuadDQ. QWC should give you, the developer, the ability to create web-based applications without you needing any knowledge of HTML5, JavaScript, CSS, or browser architecture. If you can build it with Dialog APL, then QWC will be able to do the rest. Um, so we hope that this webinar will provide you with the basic understanding of the principles behind QWC, as well as an appreciation for some of the advantages. I hope you'll also get an understanding of how GUIs can be built using QWC and how legacy systems using QuadWC can be easily updated. Uh, we'll also have information about how you can participate in the alpha release of this project. So I'll talk now a little bit about the origins of QWC. I mean, it first started uh, really when Michael presented a talk at the APL conference in Berlin in 2010 on using WPF with Dialog APL. This talk was focused on the advantage, advantages of using data binding and WPF when creating GUIs. And this is arguably the origins of the QWC project. Initially, there was great enthusiasm for this concept, but a few years later, Microsoft seemed to lose their interest in WPF and XAML, leaving Michael as a lone voice in the wilderness, expounding the advantages of data binding, irrespective of the actual um, platform involved. However, with the advent of .NET Core and new WP, Microsoft seemed to be renewing their interest in, the group, in this group of technologies around data binding, WPF, and XAML. And prior to Microsoft's renewed interest, MJH Software Services continued to look at data binding, 
believing it to be a powerful tool for both now and for the future. And during this period, Michael began to experiment with emulating the data binding techniques in WPF, but cross-platform. He did this using a tool called CSHTML5, developed by our good friends at UserWare. CSHTML5 converts XAML and C-sharp into HTML5, JavaScript, and CSS. Then, a few years ago, uh, a client provided us um, with the perfect opportunity to apply this to a practical problem. The client wanted a fast, light graphics system to run on a Raspberry Pi. With the client's permission, we demonstrated the technology behind this product at the 2018 Dialog user meeting in Belfast, and the prototype is currently in testing. Our client hopes to bring it to market very soon. Um, during the development of this emulation of w WPF, we came to the realization that similar techniques could be used to emulate other GUI creation systems, foremost of which would be Dialog's own internal uh, GUI creation system, Quad WC. We first demonstrated the principles at a BAA meeting, that's a British APL Association meeting, back in 2018, when we demonstrated an extremely rough first version of what would become QWC alongside the WPF and XAML application I mentioned earlier. Uh, then this year, uh, so, and then at, yeah, we then demonstrated, so we then demonstrated a rough version at Belfast 2018. This year at 2019, the 2019 user meeting, we led a workshop allowing the APL community to play around with an early concept version. And we hope that this webinar and other upcoming events will help us to launch an alpha version of QWC. This product has been several years in the making, uh, but recently seems to be gathering more momentum. Um, and as I say, it all relies around the core concept of data binding. So what is data binding? Well, I won't be trying to fully explain all the workings of data binding, uh, data binding, because that could be a talk all on its own. But it's such a key concept um, for the Q, uh, QWC project that I'll try to explain what it does at a very basic level. Um, basically, data binding is a mechanism that keeps two data entities in step. So any change to one of the data entities uh, causes an identical change in the other. Typically, one of the data um, entry, entities is a data property at the server end, and the other is usually a GUI property at the browser end. This means that any change to the data at the server is reflected in a graphical change on the browser, as the corresponding graphical property is also changed. Likewise, any change at the browser end, for example, a button press on the GUI, is reflected in the relevant data entity at the server end. Let's say that the server has a data property called height A, uh, which is linked with data binding to a graphical pro property for a form called, for the sake of argument, height B. If height A is changed at the server end, then the data binding automatically updates the property height B, thus changing the graphical property of the form. Similarly, if a user at the browser end changes the height B property by, say, dragging the edges of the form from data bind, uh, then data, bi data binding causes an equivalent change in the server's height, pro height A property. Thus, the server and the browser are continuously kept in step. The data binding means that QWC only needs to send the data relating to properties that have changed, rather than resending all the static um, page properties each time. This leads to smaller data packets and a quicker runtime, even on a slower internet connection. Just to stress that point, because it's pretty important, we only send the full static page the first time, uh, descriptions once at the, at the start. And then all modifications after this are triggered by small data packets. We don't send the full page each time a change is made. Okay. We will be, uh, we'll, we'll be, we will be able to emulate all of the quad WC controls by combining the controls provided by CS, HTML5, and Sync Fusion. We will also be able to extend the controls beyond those available to Quad WC 
to include some of the more advanced ones provided by Syncfusion. I'll, I'll quickly now just show you some examples of some of the Syncfusion controls. If you just bear with me a second. You can see here, here are some of, more, some of the more advanced ones which uh, are available, which are made using these Syncfusion controls. These should all be possible to emulate a uh, later date on QWC. And also show you some of, here's a chart for example. You can see different ones that are available. And some 3D ones as well. And I say all these Sync Fusion controls are compatible with QWC and will be implemented as the, as the product develops. Yeah. This is all very nice, but how do you actually implement these controls? And can QWC re really emulate QuadWC with just a character change? I'll show you now a quick demo, start the demonstration. Okay. So this is currently set up to run on my local host. Uh, we have used it with a Linux box and separate on the over the internet itself. So, okay. and you can see here the browser, the user one, has connected. Okay. Before I start the demonstration, though, I'd like to make a quick uh, caveat. Um, the loading and rendering speed is not as fast as we would like it to be at the moment. Um, so during the demonstration, please bear in mind that we are expecting significant improvements to the speed during the alpha. Uh, I will go into more detail uh, about the planned improvements uh, to speed later in the presentation. Okay, firstly, I'll show you a simple form created using QuadWC. Now, I personally prefer to work using pixels rather than proportional, uh, so all my examples will be uh, using pixel. Um, however, anything I show you today will also work with the other forms as well. So you can see here, uh, here's a basic form created using Quad WC. Ah, yes, thank you very much. Is that a bit better? Brilliant, although it's now cutting off slightly, but. You get the idea. There's the there's the, the quad WC form there. So now, if we do the same thing using um, QW, uh, QWC, first of all, again, I'm setting it to pixel. And you see here, there, it's created the form on the other side. We've lost the. There's the original form there, and you see how closely they are emulated. I go back to here, and you can see from the code itself. Aside from the only real difference is the Q and the quad there. Everything else looks the same. Okay. Uh, our aim is to replicate, re replicate uh, the functionality of quad WC as closely as possible. And quad WC allows you to omit keywords if the previous keyword is defined and, but the order remains consistent. So you see here the same information but with the keywords missing because they're in the, in the right order. I've changed the, I've changed the position slightly here. So it goes below it, but you see it creates the same form. Um, now, obviously, so therefore, we've because QWC allows you to do this, we've implemented this into QWC. Uh, I'm particularly quite proud of this uh, this feature for the only reason that it was actually the first piece of code I personally contributed to the project. Having said that, it's not quite perfect. Um, it does uh, our version um, of Q our QWC is actually case sensitive. Um, whereas Quad WC is not case sensitive. Uh, we had this pointed out to us by John Daintree um, at the recent Dialog user meeting, uh, and we will be changing QWC to bring it in line with Quad WC for the next version release. Okay, so what about changing the properties of the form? So here, you can see we've, um, as I said earlier, we're not just emulating Quad WC, but also um, Quad uh, WS which we've rather originally named QWS. And you see here, we're using it to change the position of the form. You see there on the right, the form has changed position. 
I'll just do a few more of those so you can see it moving around a bit. And the second form moves. And we change the size of the first form and the size of the second form. We can also, not only those though, we can also change uh, the captions at the top here. And we can also change the background colors. So make that one yellow. Now, as an enhancement on Quad WS, uh, we're also going to be allowing the use of standard CSS namings for colors. So in this example here, instead of the 225, those three numbers there, we can just simply say red and it works and change the other one to blue. Okay, uh, we can also add uh, a button as a child of the form. So you see there again, if I just move this along slightly so you can see, um, the note is very similar to quad WC, how you define it just with the queue there and it creates the button on the browser. Uh, we can change the size of the button and we can change the position of the button. We can also create different styles of button. So there is a radio and there is a check button there. So you can toggle that one on and that one's a toggle one. And again, the notation is very, very similar to Quad WC, just using the queue. Okay. Uh, but what about the state of the forms themselves? Well, the default state for a form is zero, which I'll show here quickly. And again, here is an example of uh, the emulation of quad WG. Uh, it's QWG, and it returns the state of zero. Yeah. Um, so when the when the state is zero, uh, the form has a size and position defined by the size and, and position property. But if we wanted to maximize the form, well, we can change the state to two. And you can see here that the form is maximized. Um, currently, the forms are displayed in the order they are created, but we will be implementing the on top property uh, from Quad WC and implementing uh, the Z index as an enhancement in future release. So you will be able to change uh, the draw order. And if we put the state back to zero, you see it returns to normal. If you wanted to minimize the form, we can set the state to one and you see the form has been minimized and it's down here uh, with, with the icon down here. This icon down here is customizable as are all of these buttons here uh, with simply with, um, with another picture file. Okay, and the caption, the right down here is simply the caption on the form. So if we change the caption property, down the, the wording down here changes as well. Okay. Uh, you can also see the minimize and maximize uh, functions on these buttons. If you see, so if you click on the minimize one, it returns. And if I draw your attention here to the maximize button, if I click on it, I don't know if you can. Hopefully, you can make that out. But you see that the the image has indeed changed. And there we go. It goes back to its normal state. So as I said, these buttons can all be customized as uh, required. Okay, um, but given that QWC is designed to run amongst other things, uh, web, web applications, we thought it would be important to include uh, an additional fourth state, um, state three. You can see here is a full screen state uh, without any borders and without the icons displaying, much like you'd see, you know, how you see, imagine a typical web application to appear. Um, bear in mind as well that once we have implemented um, images into this, you'll be able to replace the solid color uh, with the image of your choice. Uh, thus, be much creating it, making it much more like a, a web page. Let's just pop that, back and then you minimize it again. So that's the basics of changing the GUI properties. But what about the properties within the browser itself? For example, what if you wanted to change this tab up here? Well, you can, uh, just by changing the caption of the root in the same way you, you would in an APL session. Let's see if this is. So if I do that, hopefully you can see at the top here, this is now changed to MJH app. 
Um, this shows that QWC has access to the external world of the browser. Uh, any part of the browser that can be accessed with JavaScript, such as the DOM tree, the Chrome around the outside, and the cookies, can now be manipulated um, via QWC. OK, so we have shown you, shown you here that um, uh, we've shown you the changes uh, can be made to major properties from within the APL session. Uh, but what about changes at the browser end? Say if a user clicks on a button, for example. Um, well, the callback functions uh, operate just like they would in a Quad WC defined GUI. So if I just load up an example here. Okay, so you, here you can see a simple GUI uh, with three buttons that change the background color when I click on the four. There we go. Um, so now I'll quickly just show you the code. Okay. Here. So apologies. Hopefully you can see this. And you can see here, here are we're defining the, the form and the buttons. Again, very similar to the QWC, uh, Quad WC, sorry. And the callback functions is here. Again, a very simple one, just showing you how it works in exactly the same way. Now, if you, you'll bear with my typing, I'm going to attempt to try and add another button to this. So we'll see. Uh, it's already gone wrong. I, there we go. Just move that other line along a bit. So we'll make this a yellow one. Change that position there. Change that the other way. And if we go back to the go into the uh, the callback itself, again you'll see just how simple this is. If you've got any experience of working with uh, Quad WC, then you'll know you'll see how simple it can be. So a bit typing, and I say I'll use the CSS uh, start notation style this time. Okay. Should we move the right? Oh well, that's that would have broken. Look at something on the end there. Uh, the perils are trying to type live. Let's just put this back in the right place. Okay, and now if we restart the browser over here, you can see it's connected again. And if we run it, hopefully, ah, oh, no, I've done something wrong. Uh, the perils of live demonstrations. What's wrong with that? Well, sorry about that. But anyway, we will show you another example though of it working, of the callbacks working with uh, not just buttons, but also with menus. Why is this? I'm just going to quickly deal with this. Sorry, just bear with me. I do apologise. Restart it because I think I, I think I've got my lines a bit mixed up there, and they've just got a bit crossed over while I was trying to type. So, I knew that was a bit of a risk trying to do that live, but oh well. So here we are. We'll connect up another session.
And here you go, here you can see the same one. This time, we've also got a menu with the callback functions working there properly. And if I go into the code here, you can see again, it's very similar. Um, now, the eagle-eyed amongst you may notice that I used the select event. Well, you can't because it's quite obscene, but I may have got away with that. But you can see up here the select event for this one and the on select uh, for the menus. Uh, this is a, my, this is a um, slight bug um, which will be fixed in the upcoming releases. We basically forgot to add the select as a valid event for the menu. So you have to use on select. And I say that will be fixed and it will be in line with QWC as soon as possible. Um, but that minor bug aside, as I say, you can see that the select event occurs on the browser here, uh, which then updates the bcall property at the server end. Uh, data binding then keeps the browser bcall property in step with the server bcall property and changes the GUI appropriately. It is important to note that the, the callback function is handled by the server and not the browser. In this example, we are only using a very simple callback uh, function, but this callback function could be a lot more intensive. Uh, therefore, it's advantageous for the server to be doing the heavy lifting rather than the browser. Uh, it's also probably worth emphasizing again that only the properties that have changed are sent to the browser and not the entire page. This leads to smaller data packages and a faster response time even on a slow internet connections. Another example for you here. Well, that shouldn't be on the bottom there. Let's comment that out. That shouldn't be there. Okay, show you another quick example here. Um, because the callbacks are handled by the server uh, using APL, uh, there's the added advantage that any security feature, such as the requirement for a username or a password, are also handled in the APL. Uh, here is an example with two edit boxes. Uh, the username's edit box, the password property is set to default, so you'll simply see what I type in here, as you would, as you would in any other edit box. Uh, for this password one, the password property has been set to an asterisk. So whatever I type in here comes up and I say it is obscured. And if you'll notice, whereas we can we can't copy and paste the data as of here. Uh, we can manually we can manually change uh, the password property again using QWS. So if I... And there you go. As you can see, the password is now revealed. And if we put it back, to asterisk is hidden again. But you, but you don't always want to have, to have to manually start your application or start this up every time a new user connects to the browser. So is there a way to launch uh, the application when a user connects, a bit like Quad LX? Well, yes. We've created an event handler called onloaded. Uh, you simply assign the function name to onloaded when you call up, open up a new browser and the function will run. So you just bear with me. Let me start a new session for this one just to be sure. That error there was just me closing down the browser before I closed down the server. Oh, thank you for the reminder. Okay. Okay, 
So here, I keep pointing to the screen. Here, as you can see, the onload onloaded is assigned the function we designated earlier. So now, if we get two browsers going, you can see as the second one starts, they're both, there you go, opening the application. And you can see if I change the column one, the other one is unaffected. And there we go, change that one to, to green. So you can see they're independent of each other there, the two connections. Now this next bit we wouldn't recommend that you do under any circumstances, but for just demonstration purposes, we're going to assign the users there. And then we can check, see what the colors are. You can see there, user one and user two have the two different colors appearing there. And we can change them from the APL session as well. Okay, well, now for the next bit, uh, I'm going to try showing you something that's a little bit more experimental. We're still w working on finalizing all of this, um, but it's a bit more complex object uh, is the grid. It's uh, the grid, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with. So, let's bring that up. And get the demo file. As my typing has already been terrible, this. Uh... Okay, so here here we are. I can show you quickly. I'm going to quickly create a, a quick grid to show you um, how easy it is and that it is indeed possible. So again, first of all, I will change it to um, pixel, and we create the the parent form for it to go into create the grid itself, and then we should populate it values. In this case, I've just done a three by three matrix of the, of the integer one, just to get some data in there. Okay, and we can retrieve the data with the QWG function. You see here, there is the matrix ones. And we can change the values. So over here, you can see between one to nine, and if I do this again, you can see it more clearly, hopefully. There we go, we've got I to nine. Okay, so let's load another quick example. This just to show you. Now, again, we in the current version, we are currently having a little bit of a bug with uh, curse, uh, curse select, uh, curse cell. So basically, if I were to click on this grid, it wouldn't be happy and it, it would fall over. I mean, again, I like to stress this is an alpha project. We are working to iron out these bugs. Fortunately, at the moment, I say the grid is the thing in progress. Um, and I say that currently isn't working. Um, having said that, uh, we can change the cell widths. I can show you it still does work with the properties. We can change the cell widths here. Okay, and we can also see that we can change. So this tick box here, if we, Get the, assign the values to V, you can see they're there. It's this one here. If we change this one here to a zero, I'll show you that, there. Then hopefully on the form, there you go, you can see that he's unticked the box there. Okay, and now this next bit will break the form, but we wanted to show it. Uh, you can see here there's a date picker built into the form. This is using cell types, so you can put in different input types. So you've got the checkbox and the drop down menu. Uh, and the cell clicker, which as I click here, it expands. There down the bottom there is unfortunately breaking. We believe it's to do with the refresh rate. Uh, and it's basically, it's not refreshing at the right time or something. So it's getting stuck in a loop and the, and the number of stack panels are getting exceeded. Um, but you can see here, that at least, you know, we can put in the date picker and it looks quite nice. So if I load that up again, Carol, I'm showing you what we wanted to show from here. Okay, so I just wanted to show you cell types. So I'm just going to clear the different input methods off this. 
because some of them would mask the color changes that I want to show. So all I've done there is just taken off the different forms of input. Uh, and then if I set B col the colors of red and blue, you see here where the original cell types were, it's changed the colors. Now, if we wanted to change that, so to, um, again, just like you would in quad WC, uh, to change uh, to here to a matrix, so we have the different columns in different colors, and you can see there, the cell types has changed, and with it, the background color. And I just prove that's just a random one, changing it a little bit more. And one last thing to quickly show you. I have to type this one again. This is very new. So, oh, it's not me. That sh should be a C. There we go. And then if we do this, you remember the, the chart objects that we saw earlier uh, on the SyncFusion site? Well, I say the individual properties haven't been um, enabled yet and haven't been put into QWC. But it shows you here that we can instantiate the chart, and that's just the, the, the standard placeholder. So it shows you this is one, and again, one of the next things we're working on, uh, just showing you that it is, in fact, uh, possible. So that's the end of the demonstration part, back here. Okay, so now I want to just talk a little bit about what our plans are going forward. Uh, so firstly, the, uh, the, the immediate short-term up, uh, upcoming updates uh, we imagine appearing in the next release or the release after. Um, the first of all is the impl implementation of message boxes and quad DQ. Uh, we feel this is a very important part of uh, quad WC, which we currently don't emulate, uh, which four applications uh, we would like to see implemented as soon as possible. So that's something we will be bringing forward as soon as we can. Uh, we'd like to implement more of the common controls. Uh, the ones we're particularly focusing on over the next release or so is list, group, and tree view. And these have been identified by various people who have uh, told us they'd like to see these things as soon as possible. If, however, there are other con you know, people out there who would like to see different controls implemented into QWC earlier than we planned, then please just let us know and we're happy to try and implement them or move them up the priority order as it were. We'll also be work, continue to work on the grid as we feel this is a real workhorse um, of, of many applications uh, and as you can see needs to be stabilized a bit more but it's coming on nicely. And finally we also like to, to bring it more in line with Quad WC and to make things easier for the user uh, we'd also like to be able to use the control with um, this would make things a lot easier uh, as you would make defining the child's of parents a lot quicker and simpler. And as I said at the start, one of the major problems we are experiencing with QWC is the current relatively slow speed for loading and rendering. However, we are expecting to see significant improvements in the speed from a number of areas over the course of the next few releases. Our focus up to this point has mainly been on implementation with not much time given over to optimization. We plan to implement optimizational improvements over the coming months uh, to both the APL and C sharp code that's underneath it all. On top of that, there is also upcoming updates to some of the key utilities and tools that are critical to the QWC project. Uh, for instance, uh, the release of CSHTML5 version 2. Currently, this version is in alpha. Um, we are waiting for them to release the beta before implementing it into our product. The idea of having two alphas together is just scary. But as I say, ver this, this uh, version should be coming out in beta very soon. Um, and it should provide significant improvements to the overall speed. Next year, we are also expecting the release of a WebAssembly uh, version, which will provide even greater speedups. Uh, because WebAssembly will already be compiled to bytecode, it will remove the overhead for the interpreting JavaScript. And WebAssembly will also allow multi-threading in the browser. Uh, another speed improvement will come from the sync fusion controls. You remember the graphs and things I showed you earlier? Uh, well, we're currently only using the EJ1 versions of the Sync Fusion controls. Um, because these are the first version of the controls, 
Um, they have been written mainly using jQuery and aren't as fast as we would like them to be. Some EGA2 versions of the controls are now available from Syncfusion, and the rest uh, will be available early next year. These new EJ2 controls are tightly written in JavaScript and will load, render, and run much faster than the current EJ1s. And once the remaining controls have been released by uh, Syncfusion, they will be incorporated into QWC. And I say, between our own developments and optimization and the new versions of the underlying tools, we expect to see significant improvements to the overall speed over the next coming months. And we're talking in the region of 50, 100 times faster when all this is said and done. So we're hoping this will be very, very fast by the time we've implemented all this. Now, up until now, this project has been developed alongside our regular consultancy work and other projects without any external support or funding. However, we passionately believe in the potential of this project and therefore, as I mentioned earlier, with the release of the alpha version and, other, and with other projects coming near completion, I will be moving over full time to support the QWC. Uh, we hope this will increase the pace of development significantly. Uh, in addition, as part of this new role, I will be providing a dedicated email support um, for the alpha version of QWC. This means that anyone who is involved with the alpha version will have a direct line uh, for reporting any bugs uh, or requesting uh, that we assign a higher priority to any of the particular controls. Um, our aim is to have almost the entirety of Quad WC um, emulated by the release of the QWC beta. Uh, the underlying structures are all in place, and it's now mainly a matter of introducing and testing the individual controls. Um, also in this new role, I'll be uploading a list of bug fixes and implemented improvements um, so throughout the alpha development and into the beta. So you'll be able to should find those on our websites to be able to keep track of the progress we're making. We'll also provide regular updates and also working examples of implemented controls. So you can easily find out you know, working examples of the new features uh, and how you can easily experiment with them. So that's the, that's the end of uh, the webinar, really. I'd just like to quickly say we'll also be having a workshop a week on Friday. Uh, yeah, a big thanks to everyone for watching as well. Uh, and we're having a uh, workshop uh, at the BAA meeting uh, on next week on Friday. Uh, this will be down in London. If you want details about any upcoming BAA meetings or the BAA itself, that's the British APL Association, you can find them at this website here. Um, also, like to, we say there's a limited alpha version currently available for QWC. If you're interested in taking part in this closed trial, please contact Michael on the below email address there or talk to them in chat or you know, basically get in touch with us and we'll see what we can arrange. And the beta release is provisionally scheduled for early next year. Uh, I'd like to again say a big thank you to Dialog for letting us um, do this uh, webinar. And just a quick plug for the next one, which I say there won't be one in December. The next one is, here, is the 23rd of January and it's train spotting in Dialog APL. It's all about the, the, train, the function train syntax, which I'm quite looking forward to. I believe that's Richard Park. I say if anyone has any questions in the meantime or would like to talk to us about the upcoming trial, there are contact details and website. And the website's a little bit basic at the moment, but again, we'll be improving that over the next month or so. Um, so, yeah, that's it. Thank you very much for listening.